It's been said that the average person walks past somewhere between 11 and 36 murderers in their lifetime. This disturbing theory begs the question, if you came face to face with a killer, would you know it? Would you realize what the person standing in line at the supermarket or sitting next to you at a movie theater is truly capable of? Would there be something that makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up? Or would their sinister intentions be concealed behind a friendly smile? What if it were a respected member of the community, like a police officer or a teacher? Or what if they were a little bit closer to home? What if they were your own flesh and blood? Most of the time we live in blissful ignorance and we don't give much thought to the evil that brushes past us on a daily basis. This is a story of one girl whose disappearance rocked a small town and had everyone thinking, how well do you really know the people around you? Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, nice to finally meet you. I always forget to say it, so I'm going to say it now. If you haven't already subscribed to my channel, it would mean a lot to me if you did. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram as well. A lot more personal things over there, updates about what's going on here. So I'll put all that information below and also I will put it up on the screen. I also want to quickly thank all of you. I hit 400,000 subscribers, which I think is absolutely incredible and amazing. And I can't believe that that has happened. I never realized the potential of this channel and how much of you would just really appreciate what I do here. So thank you so very much. I'm so excited today because we have a new and very fun sponsor. And you're all so amazing at supporting my sponsors that help me make these videos possible. So introducing Love and Pies. It's quickly become one of my go-to mobile games to play when I need to get my mind off of these heavy topics that I research and talk about all the time. In the game, you play the adorable main character, Amelia, and she owns a cute little bakery, and you play by matching tasty ingredients that come together to bake cakes and pies, and then you serve them to your customers. But that's not all. Of course, there's a great storyline full of romance, a little drama, and some small town gossip. Oh, and I can't forget, there's also some mystery to add to the mix because someone burned down the bakery and we don't know who it is yet. The game is actually celebrating their two year anniversary with a big bake out birthday bash. And guess what? Speaking of love, John and I are definitely one of those really cheesy kind of couples that celebrates our love and every milestone that we hit. So it is our one and a half year anniversary this month. He doesn't know it, but I got him a little surprise. It's not a pie, but this delicious cake. So today we're celebrating Love and Pies milestone and ours too. Love and Pies has a two week event going on with real life baking contest, and you should definitely enter so that you have a chance to win some really cool prizes. You can find out all about the contest on the official Love and Pies Facebook and Instagram pages. I can make dessert in the game, but I cannot bake well enough to not mess this up. So I actually had this cake made. It's my own little version of the yummy cakes in the game like this one, but with my favorite color scheme of black and white, of course. Love and Pies is an easy game to play and the story unfolds the more you advance. So there's always something new to learn about. I'm so interested in solving the case that I come back every single day to keep baking. You definitely need to join me and download Love and Pies right now to get in on all the birthday fun. You definitely don't wanna miss everything new that's coming our way, events, rewards, storylines, and if you play within the next two weeks, you'll get an exclusive in-game decoration item for free. It's a birthday cake statue to commemorate the two-year anniversary of Love and Pies, and also I hope you think of me and John when you get it. So install Love and Pies and join me for the Bake Out Birthday Bash. Thanks so much to Love and Pies for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get into the case for today. Jessica Dawn Dishon was born on May 2nd, 1982 to her parents, Edna and Michael. Growing up, Jessica developed a special bond with her two younger brothers, Christopher and Michael Jr. She loved them more than anything and would often spend time teasing them like a lot of big sisters do. And one of Jessica's favorite things to joke with them about was saying that once she got her license, she wasn't gonna drive them anywhere. However, when the time came, Jessica gladly took her brothers anywhere they wanted to go because family meant a lot to her. Adults would often describe Jessica as being shy and polite. However, she let loose when she was surrounded by her friends. 
She had a really great sense of humor, so much so she would make her friends laugh so hard, drinks would come out of their noses. And that's when you know you've got a really good laugh, when you spit out your drink or it comes out of your nose. And despite her humorous antics, Jessica proved to have a serious side as well. She wasn't just all about being silly. She got her first job while she was still in high school. After class, she worked at the fast food restaurant Hardee's with her best friend, and Jessica's boss referred to her as genuinely kind with a positive personality and a good work ethic. Speaking of school, Jessica was a remarkable student. She was very proficient in math. She loved math from a young age, and I cannot relate. Numbers are definitely not my thing. But for Jessica, it came naturally to her. Many times she would play pretend and she would act like she was running a store and count fake money. So her passion for mathematics grew stronger and stronger as she progressed through her education. And it was clear to everyone around her that Jessica had a natural talent for working with numbers. And as she matured, Jessica began to contemplate her future career path. And while her initial inclination was to pursue a career as an accountant, because that makes sense, she loved numbers, or even go into the military, she had a deep affection for animals. Her love for them was evident in how much she cared for her pets and she volunteered at local animal shelters. And now that's something I can relate to. The idea of becoming a veterinarian started to emerge in Jessica's mind as she got closer and closer to graduating from high school. And she was trying to decide what her future plans were. She really liked the thought of caring for animals and positively impacting their lives and the lives of their owners. Although it was different from her original dream of becoming an accountant, Jessica couldn't deny her passion for veterinary medicine. So she was trying to decide what she wanted to do, like many teenagers that are going from high school into college. And all of this made sense because Jessica and her family lived on farmland in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. So it's clear to see where Jessica's work ethic and her love for animals stemmed from. During her early high school years, she was part of ROTC. If you don't know what that is, it's Reserve Officers Training Corps. And the ROTC is a program that gives students the skills they would need if they wanted to go into the military. Joining the military was something Jessica had expressed interest in for years. And during her time in the program, she developed quite the reputation for being trustworthy and reliable. At one point, she was even put in charge of inventory that was worth more than $100,000. So that is quite the responsibility for a teenager. However, despite enjoying everything the ROTC had to offer, she actually decided to quit during the fall of her senior year. It was her final year in school, and she really just wanted to enjoy it to the fullest. And by then, Jessica had changed her mind about joining the military altogether. So dropping out of the ROTC made sense. Jessica's dreams, like many of ours, went into many different directions. And even though she had considered things like becoming a vet, as she got older, she had become a lot more artistic. She loved cooking. And for instance, she had been planning and preparing food for her entire family, even though her brothers did say that some of her meals were a little questionable, but they're brothers, right? And they're just giving her a taste of her own medicine and teasing her back. Besides, that is how art is made. It's, it's refined through process of trial and error. Jessica planned on honing her skills and possibly going into culinary school after she graduates. So she just wanted to get her hands into a lot of different things. And unlike her parents, she didn't want to stay cocooned in the comfort of her own hometown. She planned to leave Shepherdsville as soon as she could and see what the world had to offer. When you think of living on farmland, you might think of being all alone on acres of vast land. But Jessica and her family were actually surrounded by a lot of people. They had a lot of friends and family. For one thing, Jessica's dad, Mike, he was born into a very large family. He had six siblings and her mom, Edna, had five siblings. So that was a lot of aunts and uncles and cousins around. Their property also shared a border with another family's land, the Brooks family. And over the years, the Brooks family had been really helpful and kind neighbors to Edna and Michael Dishon's family. And according to Michael, one of their sons, David, who everyone called Bucky, he would come over, help the family. They were very close. And according to Michael, Bucky, he was delayed in learning and he did have some challenges, including a low IQ, but he was a very hard worker and would help out both his families and the additions on the farm from time to time. So this was a very active family with lots of people offering their friendship and support. This is what the area looks like. It's another small town lots of land. Here is the Dishon's home and the road that they lived on. You can see there's a lot of farmland, but there are also homes nearby. But then again, on this side of Deedsville Road, 
it is a lot more rural with no homes in sight. So it's definitely more off of the beaten path than a highly populated city. And someone could definitely get lost out in those woods or even just anywhere on this land. Shepherdsville, Kentucky is a pretty safe area though. It's located within Bullitt County, which is in an area historically known for its salt mines. In contrast to a neighboring city of Louisville, which is bubbling with activity, Shepherdsville is a very sleepy suburban town and very little crime there. If you are an avid viewer of these true crime stories, you've probably heard more than once about quiet towns where nobody even locks their doors and you might question if those places actually exist. Well, despite the cliche, I'm gonna tell you, Shepherdsville really was like that. Edna and Mike had lived there their entire lives. They came from very similar families and backgrounds. When you live in such a small community for so long, you pretty much know everyone around you. Their shared background and the sense of community might have made Edna and Mike a little more trusting of those around them, which is why when that trust is broken in such a vicious way, the betrayal is much more heartbreaking. In September 1999, Jessica was 17 years old. She was a senior at Bullitt Central High School, which was only eight miles away from her home. She had always been very responsible and focused, Friends and family and her teachers were always impressed by her determination and dedication to her schoolwork. And that's why they were stunned with what happened one seemingly normal day that fall. For the Dishon family, the morning of Friday, September 10th, 1999, was pretty normal as weekdays go. The house was buzzing with activity as school lunches were made, teeth were being brushed, and coffee was quickly being gulped down. I'm sure we all can relate to those busy mornings. Edna, the matriarch of the family, was typically the very first person to leave the home in the morning. She worked at a daycare center, and she left the home at around 6 a.m. every day. Her husband, Mike, was the second to leave. He was a drywall finisher, and he was out of the house by 6.30 every day. You might think it's a little bit strange for parents to leave work before getting their children to school, but the kids were a bit older and they could handle the responsibility. The two younger boys, Michael Jr. was 13 and Christopher was 12 and they were both in middle school. They caught the bus every morning around 6.45 and it would come pick them up right outside of their home. This meant there was not much of a chance for them to get in much trouble in 15 minutes between when their dad left and the school bus arrived. At around 6.45 that morning, Michael Jr. and Christopher left for school right on time. Before they walked out the door, they noticed that their sister was still in the bath, which was pretty typical for her. Jessica, like many girls her age, liked to take her sweet time getting ready for school in the morning, but she always made it to school on time. So just like every other morning, around 7 a.m., Jessica walked out of her house and headed towards her car. It was her red Pontiac and she loved her car. This girl worked so hard to pay for it. She finally saved enough money to just buy it outright. Senior year was gonna be great for Jessica. All that stood in the way of her dreams was just one more year of high school. And after that, she would be as free as a butterfly, which she was obsessed with. She even had a tattoo of a butterfly on one of her hips. All in all, life was looking good for Jessica. And sure, like many of us, she did have challenges she was working through, but as a whole, Life wasn't bad. New school year, new car, and even a new boyfriend. As Jessica walked to her car that morning, the air had a slight edge, which signaled that fall was on its way. She got into her Pontiac ready to drive the short distance, that 12 minute drive to her school. But Jessica never made it to school that day. A few hours later, around 1.30 in the afternoon, her mom came home from work. She saw Jessica's car in the driveway, right where it had been when she left that morning. Edna immediately knew that something wasn't right. Jessica was definitely not the type to skip school for no reason. So Edna thought to herself, maybe I should check inside. I shouldn't be alarmed. Maybe she's feeling sick and took the day off. Or she had car trouble and she couldn't even make it to school. But when she walked through the house, Jessica was nowhere to be found. She didn't know what to make of the situation, so Edna called her husband thinking maybe he dropped her off at school. If not, at least maybe he knew where Jessica could be. However, the sinking feeling in her gut grew deeper as Mike let her know he had no idea where their daughter could be. Neither of them had received a call from the school to let them know that Jessica hadn't turned up. They had gone through the whole day 
as if it were the same as any other, all without knowing that their daughter had seemingly vanished. With each passing moment, Edna's worry for her daughter grew stronger. The fear and the uncertainty compelled her to search in and around Jessica's car. And when Edna took a look inside, she noticed a few things that were immediately red flags to her. First of all, Jessica's lotion, her purse, her school books, a water bottle, and her backpack were all in the back seat of the car. All of these were essential items that she would have had with her. That did not make any sense. Why would she have left them inside like that? But then Edna got an even worse feeling when she saw the keys to the car were on the floorboard. However, among these belongings, one in particular stood out. Sitting on the passenger seat was Jessica's cell phone and she could see one single shoe had been left behind. Here is that silver flip phone right on the seat. Edna's heart was racing. She knew this wasn't right at all. This is an evidence photo of the backpack and the purse. You can see they look like they're packed up, ready to go. So where is Jessica and why would she leave these things behind? Mike and Edna knew they needed to act quickly. So they made calls to everyone that knew their daughter, all of her friends, her cousins, family members. They hoped to hear that their daughter had just gone over a friend's house and that she was safe and she would be back in no time. But the initial calls did not bring them any closer to knowing where she was. Jessica's best friend, Sarah Bailey, who was also just 17 years old, said that both of them were scheduled to work that night at Hardy's and she knew that Jessica would never just miss work and she would have never just left either. She would have let somebody know what she was doing. When Jessica's brothers arrived home from school, Edna asked them when they saw their sister last and they informed her that they heard Jessica in the bathroom that morning getting ready for school. Well, Edna wasted no time. She called Jessica's high school to ask about her attendance and to her shock, she was informed that Jessica had not attended any of her classes that day and this made her very angry. She didn't understand why she had not been told, her and her husband, neither one of them had been told, that Jessica never made it to school that day. I just covered a case of a college student named Nadia Kajuji. She went missing and I'll link it in the cards. But interestingly, I talked about how in grade school, they usually do call the parents right away to let them know their child has not shown up. But as teens, when they become adults 18 and older, that stops and the colleges and the schools have no duty to report anything. Well, here's a case where the grade school seems to have dropped the ball. Jessica is not yet an adult. After making calls and finding out that no one knew where she was, it became abundantly clear that Jessica did not leave willingly. At around 5 p.m. that evening, Edna and Mike called the local police department to inform them that their 17-year-old daughter was missing. However, we've heard this many times, to their dismay, the officers refused to take any action. They labeled the situation as a teenager who ran away. But remember, they weren't even that far into this case yet there wasn't a case. This was merely a phone call to alert authorities. No investigation was going on and the family felt so frustrated. Here they are, deeply concerned about their daughter's well-being, and they would not accept the lack of concern displayed by these officers. So they were determined to find their daughter on their own. Edna and Mike decided to take matters into their own hands. I would too. The first thing they did is they reached out to all of their relatives. Remember, there's a lot. They have a big family and all of Jessica's friends. Mike called all of his brothers and sisters, seeking their aid and support in the search for his daughter. And luckily, that support system was ready to jump into action. Her relatives and friends took immediate steps to raise awareness and start searching for her. They posted missing persons flyers all over Bullitt County, in churches, gas stations, convenience stores, and this became vital for spreading the word about Jessica's disappearance. Here's what some of those flyers looked like. They had a picture of Jessica on them, who they currently said had short strawberry blonde hair because in the picture, I think it was black and white, you wouldn't have been able to tell, but she has strawberry blonde hair, blue eyes, she was five foot four and 112 pounds. A young girl going missing like this was not the norm. As a matter of fact, no one could ever remember anything like this happening in Shepherdsville. This area is vast. This is an actual evidence photo from the case. You can see how much land there is and many of the residents live on 10 acres, even up to 100 acres of land. I told you, someone could easily go missing 
and you would not be able to find them, at least not easily. If you were a landowner and you heard that someone was missing, it would take a very long time to comb your own property, not to mention venturing out beyond the land you own and helping with the search in other areas. The police had told Edna to just call back if Jessica hadn't returned by the next morning. I don't know how parents are expected to do this, but Edna had no choice. She actually decided to stay home and wait to see if her daughter came back. Meanwhile, her husband, her sons, and all the family and friends, they went out and searched for Jessica in the surrounding farmland. It was a really hard night for Edna. Of course, she couldn't sleep, but she was relieved when after tossing and turning all night, the sun finally came up. This meant she was able to report her daughter missing. So this time, the officers actually took a report from Edna. She stressed that everyone who knew Jessica knew that she was not the type to run away. How many parents have to say this? Jessica was known for being reliable. She was smart. She was family-oriented. And that family told the police that there's no way Jessica left on her own. She loved her brothers way too much. She would never just pick up and leave them behind. The fact that she left all of her items behind intensified the family's feelings that foul play was involved. Her money was still inside the wallet that was inside her purse. She couldn't have gotten that far if she had left on her own accord. Who would with all their belongings left behind? So at this point, a young deputy was dispatched from the Bullitt County Sheriff's Office out to the Dishon family home. Deputy David Greenwell, he was pretty fresh when he was assigned to this case. He'd only been working on the force for seven months and he was still getting his bearings straight. But despite not being that experienced, as soon as he took note of everything that was going on, the belongings inside the car, everything still being there, the one shoe that looked like it had been missing from the pair, he knew something was amiss. Right away, Deputy Greenwell called a colleague that had a lot more experience under his belt. His name was Detective Charles Mann. He had been on the job for over a decade. And being a police officer in a small town like Shepherdsville, you get to know the people. You know all about the different neighborhoods, the behavior of the people that live there, and you might even start to think that you can predict the outcome of a case, even before you've taken a look at it. And that's why when this rookie cop called Detective Mann that afternoon about a girl who had disappeared, he shrugged it off. He said that's just another runaway because in his mind, he was pretty certain that they would soon find Jessica. She would get tired of life on the run and she would go right back home. Except there was nothing typical about this case. Teenage runaways don't typically leave behind their cell phones, their purses, their cars. They don't typically leave without packing clothes and they don't typically walk away wearing only one shoe. So I'm really surprised that they didn't even give it a second thought about what happened here. But Deputy Greenwell wasn't satisfied with his superior's response. So he decided to call him again after being dismissed the first time. Maybe the second time he thought Detective Mann would come around and start taking him seriously. However, when he called that second time, Detective Mann told him the same thing. You see, it was the weekend and nothing would keep Detective Mann from enjoying some time off. Not even a missing child, apparently. Deputy Greenwell did not know what to do. So he just went out to the scene, took some photos, and then he went home. The dismissal of Jessica being a runaway became the first mistake in a case which was riddled with police incompetence. It's well known that in a missing person's case, that first 48 hours are critical. After that, the chances of finding a person alive decrease significantly. All of us know that by now, and we're not even detectives. Despite the police not taking Jessica's disappearance seriously, Edna and Mike were still out there with a search party of their own. However, when those 24 hours went by and they still had not found any sign of their daughter or where she had gone, that's when Jessica's parents decided to call in the big guns. They tried to get the attention of the FBI and they did. It was the unusual state of the scene outside the Dishon's home in Jessica's car. That was enough to get the FBI's attention. On Monday, the 13th of September, the FBI officially took on the disappearance of Jessica Dishon. That's when the search for the missing teen intensified. 
six FBI agents from Louisville joined the investigation. It's probably Louisville. I don't know how to say some of these places and locations. Always leave them in the comments because you teach me something. One of the first things the FBI did was impound Jessica's car for analysis. By then, it was generally believed that she had been kidnapped as she was trying to get into her car and go to school. Investigators had found a piece of plastic that belonged in the vehicle, on the vehicle, and it had broken off and it was laying in the front seat. They thought this probably happened during a struggle. Then, when the investigators took a look at her phone, they found that Jessica had dialed a single digit, the number nine. This led the investigators to believe that someone had attacked her inside her vehicle and she was struggling and she had attempted to call 911 for help. But before she could finish dialing, the assailant had gained an upper hand on her and dragged her away from her own car, and that is absolutely frightening. It looked like as she was being dragged out of her car, she grabbed onto the interior and she broke off that piece of plastic from the bottom of the driver's seat. Unfortunately, this car, even though it was a crime scene potentially, it was no help to this investigation because if this was a normal case, Jessica's car would have been a treasure trove of evidence. Maybe her assailant left fingerprints or DNA. However, this was not a normal case. The lack of police work or diligent work in this case was shocking. Why in the world would they fail to secure their biggest piece of evidence? The first day on the scene, they should have seized that car, taken it away, and kept it in a safe place so it wouldn't become contaminated. Instead, during that weekend when the police were off doing we don't even know what, friends and family members, they were in that car, in and out of it, doing their own investigation because the police had ignored their pleas for help. A news reporter had even done, I'm not kidding, a segment from inside the car. And I can see something like this happening today. It would probably be TikTokers, but they would be out there trying to be first with the biggest missing person story. And as sad as that is, the public interest is there. So when there's a demand, someone has to supply the information and that can lead to missteps. Because the evidence in the car was compromised, it was pretty much useless. Trying to even run fingerprints would have been just so incredibly difficult because there would be so many. Because of that, the FBI was left with very few starting points for this investigation. One significant challenge they faced was the timing of Jessica's disappearance. It happened after everyone in her household had left. They couldn't establish a clear timeline. So without that crucial information, the police were at a disadvantage in their search efforts. The authorities were not even sure what Jessica was wearing when she went missing. They didn't know what to be on the lookout for, and this lack of knowledge would further complicate things. Without a description of her clothing, it would become very hard for potential witnesses to have relevant information and even looking at surveillance footage. Edna tried her best to rack her brain guessing what her daughter might have been wearing by going through her clothing and trying to narrow down what is missing. She believed it could be jeans and a yellow Tommy Hilfiger t-shirt with red or orange letters on it. The agents did search Jessica's tiny bedroom. They went through all of her drawers. They looked through papers that were on her desks and notes on her nightstand and looked through an address book. One of Jessica's second cousins, Donna Mattingly, she even provided the FBI with a full list of all the calls that Jessica had made from her cell phone in the past six months. And good for her, good for this family. They were on the ball and I mean, wow, I'm impressed. We would be all so lucky if we had family members like that who cared about us and are willing to go that extra mile. It's more than I can say for this police department, that's for sure. And after Jessica had been missing for almost a week, various authorities were brought in to assist in the search finally. They had police divers out there in various bodies of water nearby. There was a pilot that had joined forces with them trying to look from the sky and see what was going on there. As the investigation gained traction throughout the town and beyond, the tips came in. There were hundreds of tips every day related to Jessica's disappearance. And among the numerous calls that came in, one was significant. It came from a truck driver. He had communicated through his CB radio and he claimed to have seen Jessica at a truck stop. The detectives in this case followed up on every single lead. They didn't want to leave any stone unturned, but despite their efforts, they were not able to locate anything with that tip. Eventually, they did offer a $10,000 reward for information leading to Jessica's whereabouts. Residents were scared. They didn't want to let their kids go outside. And one of the Dishon's neighbors, Sherry Breeding, she said this whole incident, quote, 
makes you look twice when you get in your car and lock the doors, end quote. I'm sure. I can imagine in a small town anywhere, this would be frightening. The FBI was doing all they could at that moment. They even got subpoenas for records from phone booths. Do you remember phone booths? So they got call records from phone booths in the area and they requested videotapes from all over at stores that Jessica normally went to. The FBI was also focusing on interviewing friends and family and the neighbors. During the interviews, they talked to the son of that property owner next door who shared that boundary line. Remember him? His name was Bucky Brooks. His dad owned a farm that was located just yards away from Edna and Mike's home. I'm going to show you right here. This is the Additions family home, and these properties right here belong to the Brooks. I told you in the beginning that the Dishon family and the Brooks family were very close. They were friendly. They even played softball together. But there was something about Bucky that just did not sit right with investigators. When they asked him when he had last seen Jessica, he said that it had been almost a year. This is their neighbor. How could it be almost a year without seeing her coming and going? Because in a subsequent interview, Bucky contradicted himself. Then he said, no, no, no. I saw Jessica the day she vanished. I just got the chills. She was walking towards where her high school was located. Now that was eight miles away and she had a car. So why would she go walking? She even had a cell phone. So wouldn't she have called someone for help if she was stranded because her car didn't work? And we know she left that phone behind. So detectives asked him, well, Bucky, what were you doing on the morning that Jessica went missing? And he said, I was helping my father out on the farm and I just saw her walk to her car, that's all. But this statement was suspicious. If the timeline that they did have was correct, then Bucky's story made him the last person to see Jessica before she disappeared. And because of that, he had to be brought in for formal questioning. And at this point, he underwent a polygraph. Now, I know this is like a broken record. We know polygraph machines are not, they're not reliable. It's not admissible in court as a lie detector. They're not an exact science. However, I've said this in previous cases, sometimes these tests can help detectives. They can make a suspect feel under pressure and that helps to narrow down their list. When the results of Bucky's test came in, it was not looking good because he failed. After this, those police divers were sent out to search a small pond on the land his family owned. This pond was only 50 yards from where Jessica's car was parked. Six divers went in there in their wetsuits and it was in waist deep water, so they didn't do a dive. Instead, they did a line search. They went shoulder to shoulder and they took tiny steps until they covered the entire pond. Nothing was found. Clearly at this point, they wouldn't be searching for someone alive. They were already thinking the worst. They were looking for a body. Edna told the media, quote, it just seems like a nightmare that you're trying to wake up from, but you can't, end quote. It would be a nightmare for any family or loved one. This would be heart-wrenching, especially when you know that they're looking at a pond, thinking that this isn't even a disappearance anymore. Mike said he thought that someone must have been stalking his daughter. He told reporters, quote, whoever did this had to know the routine of when we left the house that day, end quote. And he suspected it was someone close to home, Bucky Brooks. Even one of the FBI agents, Jeffrey Lipinski said, quote, the odds of this being a stranger Someone just passing through, a drifter walking by, and just happening to encounter Jessica are quite low, end quote. Remember, this is a pretty rural area. It's not like you're going to be walking to your nearest restaurant or convenience store in a busy town and run across Jessica. You almost had to have known where she lived. However, Bucky wasn't the only person that was suspicious to investigators. Reports had come in from people who swore they had actually seen Jessica after she was reported missing. And one witness was a manager of a bar in the area. They said they saw Jessica on Sunday after she had disappeared. He said he knew it was Jessica because she had a short, strawberry blonde bob, exactly like Jessica. When investigators asked what Jessica was seen doing, this man told them she was reaching into a dark car holding up a can of soda and a bag of chips. Now, this dark car was actually mentioned by a few witnesses, and two names kept popping up in connection with this black car. 
Jason Dunford and James Coulter. These two men were said to be driving a black Camaro, and Jessica was allegedly spotted in that same vehicle on more than one occasion. Now, one of the witnesses who claimed to have seen Jessica in this black car was a woman named Belinda Kyle. Belinda knew the Dishon family, and she knew what Jessica looked like. She said that the girl she saw looked just like Jessica, and she was sitting in the front seat of a black car. When they asked what Jessica was doing, she told them that Jessica looked upset as though she had been crying. Do you ever wonder if people just make this stuff up? Because I remember during the Gabby Petito case, there were people going on TikTok, there were people going all over YouTube and elsewhere, even in the news, and they were saying they saw things. I don't know if they were ever confirmed, but a lot of times people thought it was questionable. I'm not saying that any of these people are lying. I mean, maybe they do just want their five minutes of fame, but have you ever thought that maybe after the fact, when someone goes missing, people think they might have seen them? Like you rack your brain, you're like, wait, did I see her? Maybe I did see her. And maybe seeing their photo actually convinces you that you witnessed the person. Because many times eyewitness testimony is not as reliable as people think it is. Yet another witness came forward and said that she had seen a man who looked just like James at a gas station not too long after Jessica went missing. And according to that report, Jason had scratches all over his arms and face. Because of all these witnesses' accounts, the police actually brought Jason and James in for questioning. I mean, yeah, that does sound pretty suspicious, especially because Belinda said she saw Jessica or someone who looked like her inside that black Camaro. Now, James did say he knew Jessica, but he said he didn't see her on the morning that it said she went missing. But he did admit that he sold her some drugs. LSD and marijuana, according to him. Remember, this is what he said. Jessica isn't here to confirm or deny this. But according to his interview, he and Jessica had met at his house on Thursday, so a day before she went missing. And after their little transaction, they simply just went their separate ways. However, he said she did contact him about midnight that night, so this would be going into Friday at midnight, to ask if she could uh, get her hands on some more drugs, again, according to him, allegedly. But he said that he told her he wasn't gonna be home at the time, but she could go over there because she could buy the drugs from the person who was there. By now, officers believe that they are on the right track with this investigation. They have a few viable suspects and some strong leads to follow, but they were about to realize that the suspect pool would only get larger the more they spoke to people who knew Jessica. And that's kind of unusual in such a small town, but then again, as they say, idle hands are the devil's playground. And people in this town have a lot of time on their hands, but do they have blood on them as well? That's what detectives wanted to know. After chatting to some people from Jessica's high school, they found out that two months before she disappeared, she had been in an argument with another girl. The argument was about her boyfriend, supposedly. And witnesses said it got really heated So could Jessica have been kidnapped by a jealous classmate of a female, a girl in her school? Investigators also learned that someone Jessica had worked with at Hardee's had actually threatened her recently. Not much was known about the context of this threat, but the investigators talked to this coworker and they insisted that everything was fine. Whatever caused tension between them had been totally over by then. As days went on with no sign of the teenage girl, investigators had their hands full trying to narrow down their suspect list. Was Jessica taken by a creepy neighbor from next door? Was the drug dealer to blame? Or the coworker? Maybe it was the jealous girl from school and she wanted to get rid of her competition. One thing investigators were sure of though was that whoever had taken Jessica must have known their way around Shepherdsville. That meant that someone in the sleepy little town was hiding a big secret. For days, Shepherdsville remained in limbo. No one knew who to trust, and the bubble of safety that had been once around that town had been fractured. Jessica's family was not giving up their search. Mike actually went to the nearby river bottoms to look for his daughter, and his brother Stanley went with him. They stayed out there all day as long as they could, but Stanley started to feel sick, so eventually the men had to turn around and go home. But the search for Jessica, it was taxing emotionally on everyone involved and they were starting to grow even more pessimistic that they were going to find her. But finally, on September the 27th, 17 days after Jessica's disappearance, there was a significant break in this case. That day, Karen Hobbs, a bus driver, 
was traveling along her usual route in a secluded wooded area of Bullitt County off Greenwell Ford Road when something caught her eye near the Salt River. This was only about seven miles away from Jessica's home. The area was thick with brush, and it was known as a dumping ground for all sorts of trash and debris, but still, Karen spotted something that just didn't seem to fit. So she pulled over to take a closer look. What she saw would play over and over again in her nightmares for years to come. There in the brush was the body of a young woman. It was obvious that she was deceased. The body had actually been propped up against a tree and her pants were halfway down. There was also a rope that was stained with spots of red, silver, and gray paint that was wrapped around her legs. It was obvious that animals had also gotten to the remains. So this bus driver, never ever imagining she would stumble upon this, she didn't know what to do. And she wasn't even sure that she was seeing what she saw. So she called a friend, Amanda McKim, to come to that site and confirm her findings. And once Amanda and Karen went back to that location, they were 100% certain that it was not only a body, but that this was Jessica Dishon. So they immediately ran to the nearby home of Nanette Ashbaugh and they told her, we think we found Jessica and they wanted to use her phone to call the police. Now Nanette, she wasn't a stranger. Karen actually knew her. They saw each other every day and Karen knew that Nanette lived close by, so she felt safe going there for help. After they alerted the authorities, all three women went back to the site and they waited for the police to arrive. Once the investigators were told that a body had been found, they thought they'd finally found 17-year-old Jessica Dishon. So they immediately descended upon the scene. The first thing they had to do was confirm that this really was the missing teen that they had been searching for. They saw she was wearing a class ring. And when they mentioned it to Nanette, she said she knew right away that it was Jessica. Nanette and her husband were friends with the Dishon family and they were out searching for her on horseback with their dogs when she first went missing. She knew that that ring was Jessica's. She had actually looked in this area, but she hadn't noticed anything here before. Her and her husband specifically searched that area of the river bottoms because they said if anything bad happens in Bullitt County, it usually happens in that area. Now they needed to confirm that it really was Jessica. So officers had to tell Edna and Mike what they had found. They knocked on their door that evening and Edna was hoping for the best. But she knew that after all this time had passed, the news probably wasn't going to be good. The officers told them, we found your daughter. And Mike asked, is she alive? And that's when they had to break the news that she was not. And it was devastating for this family. It would be for any of us. It's the worst news that anyone can get. But they weren't done. The investigators said they needed someone to identify the body. Edna was so brave. She agreed to go out to that scene. Can you even imagine? A scene where there was a deceased female to find out if it was really her missing daughter. And as she was driving there, she was praying. She was hoping that the police had gotten this wrong, that it was someone else, that she wouldn't be the mother that would have to face the realization that their child, their only daughter, was dead. And when Edna arrived, she looked at the scene and she noticed something right away. It was the jewelry. It looked familiar. Her daughter had the same necklace and the same class ring. But then she saw something that left no doubt in her mind. On the girl's hip was a tattoo of a butterfly. And that's when she knew the badly beaten body that was lying there was her child. It was Jessica. And how incredibly heartbreaking if you just take a moment to realize the impact that would have had being a mother. Once the coroner, Tommy Capel, was on the scene, they could tell that Jessica was most likely strangled to death and it looked to be from someone's bare hands. The state of decomposition also indicated that Jessica's body had been left out in the woods for days, for those two weeks when she was missing. But how could that have been? If she had been in that area, the one where she was found, they would have spotted her much earlier. Okay, this was a remote area, that's for sure, but Karen had been able to spot Jessica just fine from the road. 
And Nanette and her husband, they said they were in this exact location and nothing had been out there. Someone would have seen that body if it had been in that same spot for that long. This information provided a very disturbing realization that that rope that was around Jessica's legs had probably been used to move her body, to drag her body from another part of this area, maybe even more than once. And sure enough, about 15 feet away, they not only found hair, but also bodily fluid. And after seeing this, it was suspected that about 18 hours before she was found, Jessica was dragged from another part of these woods to where she was located. The final location she was found was significantly closer to the road, and she was positioned in a way that would make it very easy for her to be found, which meant that whoever had done this wanted her to be seen. But why? What would a killer have to gain from the police finding Jessica's body? This could be some sick game that they were playing, or there could be more to the story than met the eye. An autopsy was done by medical examiner Dr. Emily Craig, a forensic pathologist, on September 29th. They wanted to determine the official identification as well as the manner and cause of death. Dental records confirmed that the body was Jessica's and she was in very bad shape. Her jaw was broken. It actually looked like someone had punched her so hard that they had crushed her face. She had bruises all over her body. The medical examiner determined that she had lived through a horrible torture before her death. And the fact that her pants had been pulled down signified that she was forced to have intercourse. However, because of the stage of the decomposition, the doctor could not conclusively determine that that had happened. The cause of death, manual strangulation, and the manner of death, obviously homicide. It was also determined that Jessica had most likely been kept alive and tortured for at least three days before she was killed. That is absolutely horrifying. And you'll know why I'm saying this a little later because I told you about a few things that we're gonna talk about. There was also some kind of tiny pieces of foam material that was found on her body, which meant she had not been killed in these woods. Instead, she had been deposited there after she was murdered. And because she had possibly been moved more than once, the killer most likely was someone that lived in this area that was able to get around easily and not be seen. Maybe someone that no one would suspect. On October 2nd, a crisp fall day in Kentucky, Jessica Dawn Dishon was laid to rest. Over 400 people gathered inside the church to pay their final respects to the young woman whose life had been cut short. Her friends, her family members, aunts, uncles, cousins, as well as so many members of the community were left grieving and searching for answers. Jessica's blue and black casket was lowered into the ground and there was a question in so many people's minds. Why did this happen to Jessica? After her body was found, the investigation began to ramp up significantly because everyone wanted answers. They wanted the killer caught so that they could feel safe in their home again and the sense of security they had back again. Investigators go back to the drawing board and brought in their prime suspect again. The one person that stood out from the rest, 40-year-old farm worker, David Bucky Brooks. Jessica's neighbor. You already know that there were inconsistencies during his prior interviews and he actually failed multiple polygraphs. But there was also some things he said during his interrogation that made investigators feel very uneasy. For example, when he was being asked where he thought Jessica might be, he said he didn't know where her body was. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting considering this interview occurred before her body was found. Investigators found that to be very strange that he would refer to her as body instead of as a living person. That's definitely a red flag. But then there was the fact that the police had asked for permission to search the Brooks family farm, and they said no. So this made both the police and the Dishon family very suspicious. Why would they have something to hide? There were some members of the Dishon family that already started to accuse the Brooks family of having something to do with Jessica's disappearance. And word was getting out that the Dishons felt this way. And in retaliation or maybe in their own defense, Bucky and some of his brothers allegedly started to harass and stalk members of the Dishon family. That's not cruel at all, especially with everything they're going through at the time. Why? They also allegedly made very disturbing phone calls to members of Jessica's family. And the allegations of harassment were eventually proven 
because the Dishon family tracked those phone calls and they were the Brooks. With this evidence, the authorities stepped in and they arrested the brothers for harassing this poor family. Bucky was ordered not to come within a thousand feet of Jessica's family, but on more than one occasion, of course, he violated that restraining order. He even landed himself in jail for 30 days because he decided it would be wise, for whatever reason, to go on the Dishon's property in the middle of the night one night. Clearly, the Brooks brothers were drawing a lot of attention to themselves and the police were taking notes. They also noticed that Bucky's story about where he was on the morning that Jessica disappeared, it kept changing. But finally, he said that he never saw her because he was at work. Yet nobody that he worked with could definitively back up his alibi. Not only that, in one instance, when they inquired about Bucky's potential response, if they were to tell him that his fingerprints were discovered on Jessica's body, to their surprise, Bucky said if they told him that, he would be compelled to confess to her murder. These responses definitely deviated from the norm. So they raised even more questions about Bucky's involvement. But did all this circumstantial evidence prove that Bucky was Jessica's killer? The short answer is no. The long answer, well, the nail in the coffin for Bucky came when investigators eventually gained access to that farmland. A search warrant was obtained to see if they could find Jessica's missing shoe or any other evidence that connected the murder to Bucky Brooks. As the cadaver dogs searched this farm, they came across a pair of gloves. And these gloves not only made the dog stop, but they smelled so badly like human remains. Later, investigators came across rope in Bucky's work van that looked very similar to the one that had been tied around Jessica's ankles. The investigators recognized the potential significance of this discovery, and they sent that rope in for analysis. Detectives were confident that they were progressing with this investigation as they were focusing on Bucky. And this confidence was further reinforced when they got a tip. There was evidence that Bucky rented a carpet cleaning machine at 11 p.m. on September 27th, and he returned it at eight o'clock in the morning. That was the night that Jessica's body was discovered. So, of course, the detectives thought he's trying to conceal evidence. However, Bucky and his brother, they willingly provided their blood, their hair samples, and they said they had nothing to do with Jessica's death. Bucky Brooks failed four of the six polygraphs they gave him. The other two that he didn't fail were just inconclusive. So all of this evidence being found, it escalated into a family feud between the Dishons and the Brooks. And because this was a small town, the whole community was in an uproar because they knew both of these families, they didn't want to have to pick sides, and they didn't know what to believe. There were people on both sides. Some that say there's no way Bucky did it, some people that say, yeah, they were definitely involved. Eventually, when the crime lab was examining that rope found in Bucky's van, they determined that it was identical to the rope found on Jessica's body. I mean, look how close these properties are. It makes perfect sense that he could easily have done this. So with all this evidence, investigators concluded that Bucky Brooks had indeed kidnapped, tortured, and murdered Jessica. They also determined that Bucky had enlisted the help of his brothers to clean up the crime scene and dispose of her body on the side of the road. And now it was time to build their case against them. Now, it did take a considerable amount of time. About 16 months went by, and in January of 2001, a grand jury was convened to examine all the evidence in this case. But following those court proceedings, an indictment was granted, and it led to the arrest of David Bucky Brooks. He was officially charged with capital murder in the death of Jessica Dishon, as well as kidnapping, tampering with physical evidence, and complicity. His brother, 35-year-old Joseph Tommy Brooks, was also charged with tampering with evidence. Bucky was placed in custody while he was waiting his trial, and he was held without bond. Now, his brother Tommy, on the other hand, he was granted the option of posting bail. That was set at $100,000. The Dishon family was obviously very relieved. They finally felt that they were getting somewhere. Here's what Edna and Mike had to say when they were outside that courthouse talking to reporters. Now maybe they get the murders off the street and it won't be no other innocent girl that right. kicked Thank God. We're just very happy knowing that justice is finally going to be served. It was definitely an emotional time. I can see the tears in Edna's eyes. In an interview with the Courier-Journal, Edna shared her profound experience during this pivotal moment. 
She described feeling like Jessica's spirit had passed through her as if her daughter was there with them. Jessica's father said that the news of Bucky Brooks finally being charged with Jessica's murder was almost too much for him to even comprehend. Think about it. It's someone they knew, someone close to their family. It's hard to believe that they would do something like that and why. But like I said, not everyone believed that Bucky was guilty. Irene, Bucky's wife, who had married him when she was only 16 years old, she said she had doubts that he was guilty. And even though he was arrested, he maintained his innocence, arguing that all this evidence against him was merely circumstantial. So you're watching this video, you're getting to the end, and you're probably thinking this is a slam dunk case. You can leave the video because it's case closed. Of course, it appears as though the investigators have done everything they needed to do. They found the killer, and now they're going to lock him up for the rest of his life. Well, you're going to find with this story that nothing is ever that simple, is it? Buggy's defense team, they brought a whole new perspective on what the investigators had regarded as indisputable evidence. The trial didn't begin until January of 2003. Bucky found himself facing the death penalty, but I told you, things would go in a direction that you wouldn't have expected. Let's start at the top. A sample of Bucky's DNA had been collected during this investigation, and this sample was compared to the DNA found on and around Jessica's body. Those two samples were not a match. Bucky's lawyer also mentioned something that is very important to remember with this case, and it's something I mentioned early on foreshadowing this exact moment. Recall that I said, that Bucky had an IQ that was quite a bit lower than average. In fact, his IQ was so low that it actually did qualify as a learning disability. This makes Bucky very impressionable. So impressionable that when faced with seasoned FBI agents who were demanding that he answer their questions in an interrogation room, he might say whatever they want. His IQ also meant that he might not have fully understood these questions. And that changes things, doesn't it? But wait. What about when he referenced Jessica's body? Well, investigators now admit that Bucky's interrogation had never been recorded and that there was just notes taken and they weren't verbatim. This means that they were paraphrased. So what is all this saying? Well, it's saying that, you know, these officers are taking notes that might not be that reliable. And in addition to that, they said that they had already been referring to Jessica as Jessica's body in the interrogation before Bucky even used that term on his own. Wow, and I've seen this before. It's not even a shocker to me. But remember when I mentioned police incompetence? That definitely should have given you your first clue of how this case was going to go. I know that all of you are very detail-oriented, just like me. I know you're taking mental notes. Well, this case had tons of bad police work that could not be ignored. The defense was opening every door to show the jury each misstep. For example, remember those pictures that were taken by Deputy Greenwell of Jessica's car when he first went over to the Dishon's home? Well, they were nowhere to be found. I would say that's pretty questionable, don't you think? Wouldn't you keep these very important photos in a safe place? Then Detective Charles Mann, remember him? When questioned, he admitted that he didn't remember ever speaking to some of the witnesses that claimed to have seen Jessica after her disappearance. So did he just make that up? Because he also doesn't remember talking to James. You remember the guy with the black Camaro who allegedly was Jessica's drug dealer? If that was a lead, why wasn't it followed up? Because he's saying he doesn't even remember James being brought in for questioning. It's the defense's job to possibly show that there are other suspects, other people who could have committed this crime and not Bucky. And the defense actually suggested it could have been James and his friend Jason. Both men had allegedly admitted to the police that they had an encounter with her the night before she went missing and they were selling her drugs that night. The defense further emphasized that two pieces of LSD were discovered in Jessica's purse, which they argued could have been connected to James and Jason, yet this wasn't even looked into by the prosecution at all. However, the defense attorneys, they did look into it. They got that Camaro, they tested it for DNA and fingerprints, and they found no evidence of Jessica. Edna was not happy. She expressed a lot of frustration and disappointment with the defense team. She felt like they were focusing on Jessica's alleged drug purchases as a deliberate attempt to make her look bad. 
and take the attention away from Bucky, and she was not happy about it. And the only thing the prosecutors really drove home in their opening statement and their presentation of the case was Bucky's varying accounts to the police regarding the last time he saw Jessica. These inconsistent statements were highlighted as the key element in the prosecution's case against him. They didn't even suggest a motive, not that they had to for a guilty verdict, but their arguments were lacking. The defense claimed the detectives involved in Jessica's case failed to pursue any other potential suspects other than Bucky once he was on their radar. An easy way to put all this is that they had tunnel vision and it kept them from apprehending the real killer and that's frightening. When the jury members listened to both sides of the story, they were pretty sure that they weren't going to be able to decide on this case. There were way too many things to question. But then there was an unexpected twist. They never even got to deliberate on a verdict because during Detective Charles Mann's testimony, he was asked why the police were so laser focused on Bucky. And his answer put this whole trial to an end. He said that police were suspicious of Bucky because he failed a lie detector test. <sighs> I mentioned this earlier, but the results of lie detectors tests are not allowed in court. This also means that they can't be mentioned during testimony because it could influence the jury. This judge had no choice but to declare a mistrial. According to Bucky Brooks' attorney, the sheriff deliberately did this because he wanted to ruin this trial because he thought that Bucky was almost going to be acquitted. It's clear that even though the judge had brought this trial to a sudden end, the jury themselves had already decided there was not enough evidence against Bucky to prove he was guilty. Here's one of these jury members right now talking to reporters. I felt that Bucky Brooks absolutely was not guilty. An innocent man was in jail while there was a killer still on the streets. Some of the people in the jury actually said they were disgusted that Bucky was charged in the first place. I know that's hard for some of us to believe, but with the lack of evidence, it became clear that this is probably a botched investigation. Soon after the judge declared this mistrial, prosecutors decided that they were going to dismiss the entire case against Bucky. In September of 2003, Bucky walked free after just two years in prison. Now Bucky's brother, he had already seen his charges completely dismissed. In an interview with the news courier, Bucky Brooks expressed his shock. He was shocked, but also excited that he was being released. However, Bucky's emotions were not shared by the majority. They were not happy. Jessica's family was devastated when they learned that the prime suspect in the murder of their daughter had his charges dropped. After years of hoping they were gonna get justice, this felt like a major setback, and it was. They thought this case would never be solved. Year after year, and nothing. No new suspects, no new leads, and the truth about what happened to Jessica seemed to be slipping further and further away. In September of 2004, Family and friends gathered together on the fifth anniversary of her murder. 30 people came together at her grave. They were there to honor her memory. There was still this underlying concern that Jessica's story would fade from the public. Her family really wanted the media to remember her, to keep her name alive, and to get justice. For over a decade, this family endured an agonizing wait for answers. But then 13 years after her murder, Jessica's case was back in the headlines. And it was all because of one tip. And that tip came from the most unlikely and not always the most reliable place. It came from prison. An inmate came forward with a story to tell. And by then, a woman named Lynn Hunt had been appointed as a new lead detective in this case. When she heard that a prisoner had decided to come forward with information about the case, she could not wait to hear what he had to say. When Detective Hunt was assigned to Jessica's case, one of her first tasks was to familiarize herself with Jessica's family. She made it a priority to meet Jessica's parents and her brothers, and she went to Jessica's home. When she entered that house, Detective Hunt was struck by the sight of Jessica's bedroom. It was meticulously preserved like a shrine for the past 13 years. She couldn't help but be in awe of Edna and Mike's commitment to preserving their daughter's memory. So she wanted to be as committed to putting the killer behind bars. The inmate told her that one of his buddies in prison had told him a crazy story. He said that it happened back in 1999, that he kidnapped and strangled a girl in Shepherdsville. But he also gave a name, Jessica Dishon. The reason the man said he murdered her? Well, because he had been having sex with her for years. Now remember, 
Jessica was only 17 at the time of her murder. So any adult that was having relations with her, even at that point, let alone years before, would definitely be a cause for concern. And this man went on to say that he decided to murder Jessica because she had a new boyfriend and she was getting closer and closer to him. And this man was afraid that Jessica was going to reveal all of the disgusting secrets that he was making her keep for so long. The man had held on to this story for years because he feared that if he told the truth, he would lose the love and support of his family. Not just because everyone would know what a monster he was. That was part of it, but it was worse than that. This man's brother was Jessica's father, Mike. It turns out the man who had just confessed to killing Jessica was none other than her own uncle, Stanley Dishon. Remember, he was helping Mike search through the woods until he felt sick and wanted to turn in? Well, now you know the real reason, and I'm sure he was sick because he is sick, knowing that his true nature was going to be uncovered. Stanley was not a good man, obviously, we know that, but when this inmate came forward with the story, he was already serving a 10-year sentence for being inappropriate and completely indecent with two young children eight-year-old, and a 10-year-old. He was also facing even more legal trouble after it came out that he was doing these same disgusting acts to relatives' children. That's right. So more people were coming forward. Stanley had access to children because he needed a place to stay. And guess who gave him a place to stay? His own flesh and blood, his relatives. So he bounced back and forth and all around between different relatives. And if they had children, guess what? They would take him in they would feed him. They would clothe him. You know what he would do to repay them? He would do awful things to their little ones. He had lived with Edna and Mike on and off for years, which meant he was able to gain access to Jessica and hurt her. Stanley's name had actually come up during Bucky's trial because of the news of this deviant behavior that he had. However, Stanley was never questioned during this investigation. Yep, I can believe it, and I'm sure you can too. Stanley's ex-wife actually commented that she was surprised that he had never been interviewed because according to her, his behavior during Jessica's disappearance was really strange, that he was obsessed with watching news about this case on TV. That is absolutely frightening. Mike also remembered his brother's behavior as being very odd. He said that Stanley was part of the search parties, But then he became even more excessively involved to the point where he was being overbearing. Mike also said that when the search party were getting closer to the area where Jessica was eventually found, Stanley was shaking. He couldn't handle it. Finally, when Jessica's body was found, he remembered that Stanley had thrown up. He vomited. So he did get sick after all because he is sick. He's a monster. Mike said that he found it very odd for Stanley to have such a dramatic reaction because him and his wife, they didn't even have a reaction like that. It was even more intense. And Mike started to think back to their childhood and he realized that he remembered Stanley being very violent. There were two incidents he remembers. One time, Stanley stabbed one of his brothers and another time, he shot one of his brothers. And this man was still allowed to be on the streets. If he could do this to his own family, imagine what he could do to a person that doesn't even share the same blood. It's hard to imagine that this man was right in front of the investigator's face this entire time and no one thought to question him. When he was eventually interviewed more than a decade later, he denied all of the allegations. He swore that he would never ever hurt his own niece. And this was despite the fact that he was serving time for hurting other relatives' children. Once investigators identified the man they believed actually killed Jessica, prosecutors were left with a couple of choices, either take Stanley to trial and seek the death penalty or offer him a plea deal. But what they thought was a choice ended up not being a choice at all thanks to police incompetence yet again. It turns out that none, zero, none of the evidence relating to Jessica's case had ever been stored correctly. This meant that forensic teams, they were not able to test Stanley's DNA or anyone's DNA against anything found on or around Jessica's body. Do you sometimes think that investigators or police should be charged with anything in these cases? I'm just curious, not trying to start any fights in the comment section. Prosecutors had also tried and failed to convict another man of the same crime, 
so their odds weren't great against securing a guilty verdict against Stanley. Jessica's family had always firmly believed that Stanley had been wrongly accused and wrongly imprisoned on those sexually related charges. And that belief was going to be a challenge for Detective Hunt. It was going to be difficult to convince Jessica's parents that her own uncle was responsible for her murder. Hunt realized that in order to overcome this obstacle, she needed to find concrete physical evidence linking Stanley to Jessica's murder. Because without it, it was gonna be nearly impossible to establish a convincing case against Stanley. So, she embarked on a diligent search, finding any trace, any clue, any evidence that could definitively connect Stanley to this crime. And one of the details that this inmate confessed that Stanley told him was that he buried Jessica's shoe at the base of a large tree near where the body was found. So Detective Hunt actually went out there with Michael Jr., Jessica's little brother, and searched that area, but they didn't find anything. However, when they were on their way back, they walked past an abandoned barn where Michael said that he and Jessica used to hang out with their friends when they were growing up. And the detective was stunned. She thought, could it be possible that this was the barn where Stanley had been keeping and had eventually killed Jessica? So on a hunch, she went into that barn to investigate. And when she was in there, out of the corner of her eye, she saw a bed sheet sticking out of some mud. The pattern match a comforter that she had seen in Jessica's perfectly preserved bedroom. How could this even be possible? Could it be possible? Well, the detective ran back to the Dishon's house. She asked to go inside and check the bed and she couldn't believe it. There was a sheet missing from Jessica's bed. Edna identified the muddy bed sheet inside the barn as the one that should have been on her daughter's bed. Wow. Imagine if a thorough investigation had actually been done by the police so many years ago. When the news broke that Jessica's uncle Stanley had murdered her to conceal the years of his harm, her family was left in shock. It shattered their perception of the person they thought they knew and trusted for so long. Jessica's entire family struggled to come to terms with this horrifying reality. It was difficult to fathom that someone so close within their own bloodline could commit such a heinous act. As this investigation unfolded, more dark secrets began to surface. Other relatives started coming forward, revealing that they had also fallen victim to Stanley's harm over the years. The absolute courage of these individuals to share their painful experiences shed so much light on the extent of this monster's crimes. And it impacted the family so much that Mike Dishon said that he wanted to see his brother die for what he had done. At this point, Stanley was told by his lawyers that the prosecutors would be allowed to submit evidence of his previous sexually related convictions if he was tried for Jessica's murder. So they offered Stanley a plea deal. He could plead guilty to manslaughter as well as the other sexual crimes that he was accused of. And in return, he would only serve 20 years in prison. Finally, after a long and intense interrogation, Stanley could no longer bear the emotional burden anymore. He entered an Alford plea, which it's just pathetic to me. But anyway, it's a legal maneuver where defendants maintain their innocence, but they will acknowledge that the prosecution has enough evidence to convict them. Such a coward. Couldn't even admit it. In January of 2015, 15 years after Jessica was murdered, Stanley finally accepted the offer. Jessica's killer was finally brought to justice. On the day of Stanley Dishon's sentencing hearing, the survivors of the horrific crimes, they all gathered in the courtroom wanting answers. They wanted to know why he committed these acts. But to their dismay, he chose to remain silent. It is his right, but he is a monster. Edna and Mike sat in that courtroom together. Even though they were divorced at the time, they sat in the front row, united in their grief and their shared loss. They wouldn't look at Stanley. They couldn't even bear to see him. It's difficult to listen to Jessica's story and not feel a sense of frustration at all the ways the law enforcement failed her right from the moment she disappeared. She was assumed to have been a runaway despite everything indicating something more sinister had occurred. She was presumed to have been kept alive for days after she was kidnapped, which means that that was a crucial time that investigators could have used to find her and save her. Even after her death, she was let down. The case was so badly mishandled that now the person that killed her was able to walk away from prison in only 20 years. 20 years in exchange for a life as vibrant as Jessica's seems like a huge miscarriage of justice to me. And let's not forget the other victims in this case. Bucky, 
whose life was turned upside down, Jessica's parents and siblings, who went far too long without justice, and all the residents of the town of Shepherdsville. We can only hope that Jessica's family was finally set free by the truth that they waited so long to hear, even though there's never really any closure in these cases. And for Jessica, one hope for her is that she too is free and that she's soaring with the butterflies that she loves so dearly. As we're wrapping up today's case, we're left to face a disturbing truth that haunts the memory of Jessica Dishon. Her killer wasn't a faceless monster lurking in the shadows. He was someone who walked freely among his friends, his family, and his community. He was welcomed into the Dishon household by those who trusted him the most, and he repeatedly forced poor Jessica to do things against her will, thinking that she would keep their family secret. According to the inmate on the morning Jessica disappeared, she had a confrontation with her uncle. He was still hurting her, and that morning, Jessica had enough of it. She was growing up, and she threatened to tell someone about what he had done. This made Stanley mad. The inmate told Detective Hunt how Stanley admitted to punching Jessica in the face and incapacitating her. Then he took her to an abandoned barn where he had his way with her for days, then strangled her and left her body in the woods. In the years after he murdered Jessica, this man sat at the same table as her parents and siblings, pretending to feel grief, mimicking mourning, and concealing his guilt behind a mask of supposed normality. The reality of the situation forces us to confront an uncomfortable question, one that offers no easy answers. Would you know if a killer was sitting right beside you? Thank you all so very much for giving Jessica your time. Thank you so much for being here and supporting me and this channel. I will see you in my next video. Bye.